Welcome to the Startup Grind. Um, so let me tell you a bit about Startup Grind. Startup Grind is uh, it's basically a community of entrepreneurs and founders. It's a global community made up of small local communities that make up the whole. Um, how Startup Grind began, it began in a small office in Silicon Valley where about nine entrepreneurs uh, just met together and talked about what they were doing, what kind of challenges they face, um, and then they learned that they, could, that they could actually get so much value from each other. And then they met a second time, and this time there were about, I think, 13 of them. And then they just kept meeting, and then the numbers kept growing, and then they thought maybe we should bring in someone who, could, uh, who we could learn from, someone who's gone before us, who founded a company and made it. Um, so they could teach us something about the industry or about entrepreneurship, and that's how they started inviting speakers who they could interview. And then slowly the numbers grew until people would break out and start startup grind in their own cities in DC, in Arizona. And then in about a year's time, it grew to beyond America, it grew to Europe, it grew to Asia. At the moment, Startup Grind is in about 85 cities in more than 40 countries. And so I took the initiative to start Startup Grind Nairobi. Um, at the moment, there's two chapters in Kenya. There's Nairobi and Kakamega. Um, I think the initiator of the Kakamega chapter should be with us. Um, she's supposed to attend this. Um, so my motivation for Startup Grind, personally, I'm an entrepreneur and uh, what, what I would say has helped us along most in our entrepreneurial journey is networks, is the people you know who could answer a certain problem that you have or who could give you access to a certain resource that you need. And um, you understand that it becomes very important to have uh, a, place, a place to go to for these kind of things. It's like universities and their alumni networks. They become very worthwhile, uh, worthwhile very useful. So I'd like to create something like that in Nairobi, where entrepreneurs know a place they can come to, to meet each other, learn about what everyone else is doing, meet people who will add value to them, who will give them advice, um, who will give them access to what they need. And I'd like to make Startup Grind that place, um, just that community specifically for founders and uh, entrepreneurs, where we come to add value to each other and hopefully grow each other, grow the entrepreneurial scene, because at the end of the day, Entrepreneurship is about solving problems. So we need to inspire each other to build businesses that matter. And we need to hear from people who have actually built businesses that matter, um, who have that perspective of what is missing because they can see what's already being done. Uh, yeah, so with that, welcome. Welcome. I hope you'll enjoy yourself. I hope you'll meet someone who you'll be glad you've met. And yeah, have a good time. Um, for those of us who came a bit late, my name is Wangashi. Um, and without much further ado, we shall invite our speaker uh, for this month. Um, as Betty said, last month we had Ben Lyon of Copo Copo, and this time we are honored to have the one and only Oreo Kolo. Um, you'll notice she has new hair. <laughs> Um, and she'll be interviewed by Kinyanjui. Kinyanjui is an entrepreneur as well. So speaking from an entrepreneurship perspective, let's get to hear Ori's story more. Let's get to answer some questions that we have. Talk, talk, talk. Good evening, everybody. Kinyanju is the name. I'm glad that you guys could manage to make it uh, the jump uh, back to school, clearly. Ori, asante sana. Thanks for having me. And uh, we're glad. Um, how is your Kiswahili, by the way? How is it? Is it fluent? You know you've been abroad half of the time. Can we do it in Swahili? <laughs> please, please, please. Kenyan, Kenyan, Kenyan. Mzalendo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I should be over ambitious. <laughs> so it is no bad. 
uh, but but um, congratulations, yeah. by the way, Asante. Mm? Asante. Uh, for for quite a bit what you've achieved, and uh, you recently came back from 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 states where you've been awarded, been very influential. Um, how has the news broken down to you? Who told you? Hmm? They sent an email, ah. uh, which at first I thought was spam. Uh, <laughs> no, they, they, they sent an email a few weeks before, uh, because as part of the process, they fact check, so you're nominated and they select you, but they also fact check that the stuff that people say you've done, you've actually done. Um, and so it was about three weeks, or four weeks maybe, before the, the announcement was, was made. Um, yeah, so it was a huge surprise, a big deal, and I think my husband was probably a lot more like, it's like, oh my God, you know, you know I can't wait to tell uh, everybody, and I was more like, well, what does this mean? Um, but it was it was big, and I think uh, for for me in particular, um, and Betty Murungi on Twitter sent me a tweet. She's like, you leaned all the way in uh, with this one. I think for me it was important that it was in the leadership category um, and not in some of the other sort of spaces that I've been. Uh, because as a woman, you know, t if you look at the profile of the other people recognized in the leadership categories, it's a pretty big deal. Um, and I think that sort of validated a lot of the work that I'd been doing and where I think I'm headed. Um, so it was good and I think them saying that it's, because part of it, you're like, well, I'm only just getting started, you know, so the expectations are so high now. Uh, but they always say, when I was speaking to them in New York, that it's, a lot of it is also not really people who are influential, sort of, or big now, but where they think you're headed. So that's a good thing. Someone thinks I'm headed somewhere important down the road. Uh, but but it, it was big, I think, not not really just for me, but for, uh, the country, for the region, for young women, for working mothers. Uh, I think those symbols, lists are always controversial, but I think the recognition um, and, and that my story hopefully is able to inspire other people uh, is a big deal. Okay. And it's clearly you, you, you've done quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of things from, from Uzalendo, Umzalendo to, to Shahidi and the likes. And one, one, one um, uh, would be wondering, how is it that you might be a co-founder, uh, entrepreneur, um, at the same time be a mother, wife, um, and many other things, friends and the likes? How, how do you balance and be effective in all of them? Uh, I, I don't sleep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sleep deprivation is, is a friend of mine. I think there's, uh, I, I forget Mark Zuckerberg's sister, uh, had something like, oh, it's a famous sort of thing where you can only, I think it's either work, exercise, family and friends, and three of the four of that combination uh, work. So I, I don't have much of a social life, uh, I think, outside of my family, so I'm pretty in the internet. That's why I'm on Twitter so much, because I have no like social life. Um, <laughs> Twitter is like my social life. Um, but I, look, I think I was, say you, you, you're not sort of doing all things optimally at the, at the same time. Uh, I've been very fortunate that the space that I work in, which is technology, doesn't require FaceTime. Um, so with Mzalendo, Conrad is here somewhere. Um, I think we've had a total of about two hour FaceTime meetings on Mzalendo in the 10 years or so that it's been up and running. Um, or maybe three hours, and, and those three hours were like in Java, uh, <laughs> over breakfast or something. Um, because technology has allowed us to sort of communicate over Skype or phone call, SMS or DMs, like you can believe how many big decisions I make over DM in 140 characters. Um, so I've, I've been lucky to be in a space that doesn't require FaceTime. Uh, whether it was at Google or at Omedia Now or with Ushahidi or Mzalendo, which extends um, your ability to do multiple things. Uh, I'm very lucky to have a, a super supportive husband and father to my children. Um, so I always tell women who are 
sort of uh, juggling how do I manage work and kids and all. Like fathers can parent, believe it or not. <laughs> and, if you, and if you actually give them the space to do it, they're really good at it. Because uh, I see some of my friends, you know, they want the dads involved, but they're micromanaging, you know, hold the bottle like this and don't do that. And why are they crying? And like, you can't have it both ways. If you, you find most fathers actually happy to be involved, if, if uh, either you let them or if you don't give them the choice or like, you know. Um, and so I've, I've been very lucky. We have three young girls, seven, five, and two. Uh, but I always joke and say the moms at the school know him more than me. And, uh, you know, I show up and they're like, and who are you? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, you're Gabby's mom. Okay, we know your, we know your husband. And we like his, and that's a good thing, I think, that, that um, parenting is, is a two-way thing, and that really helps a lot. Um, I think I've, I, was, I was speaking at uh, Harvard Business School. I was on a panel like of all women talking about the same sort of issues, careers, our work, and how we, we balance that. And there was an old, a more experienced, older, like sort of, and I was like, I can't wait to get to that stage where I just speak with like no filter and, and no thinking. And what, you know, she's like, she just tells it as it is. And someone asked her, well, how do you balance? You have three boys. She has, on, I don't know how many boards. She has a business, been married for 25 years. And she's like, look, I intend to win on all three fronts, my business, as a wife, and as a mother. So it's not an option for her. Uh, she's never had a conversation about juggling or fitting or balancing. It's like, there's nothing. I'm winning. I said to myself, I'm winning on all three fronts, and that's how I've treated it. And, you know, um, that son was there that come with her to the conference. I think sort of having that mentality helps a little bit when you're you decide for you if family is important, um, you prioritize that, everything else works around that. Um, for me, it's one of the things. I think there's never a choice, really. Uh, yeah, long-winded answer, but you know, no sleep, win on all three fronts, and fathers can parent. <laughs> if I can sum it down into how it um, And um, like, like the journey, your journey is quite interesting because you find yourself um, uh, doing law, a law degree, and um, is it political science, right? Yes. And political science, and then over and above that, um, you you turn down different job offers. Uh, but w but then to to come back to Africa, and the job offers were not this the small little things. Was that really the plan to actually um, come back and 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 engage um, in transparency, in governance, in in, in monitoring and, and the works. Was that the plan, the overall vision after you had actually gotten your law degree? Uh, no. <laughs> so I, I think I'm an interesting case study of, 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 of someone where there's like no plan and then <laughs> things still work out. Uh, my compass has always been my passion. And, and so I follow things that I'm passionate about, and I just had the faith that everything else would work out. Uh, so law was actually a passion of mine, and I was one of those weird people who knew what they wanted to do when they were like six. Um, and you know, I was very nerdy, and uh, I discovered there was a profession, and I, my, my nose was always in a book. You know, in fact, I remember my mom saying, you're never going to get married because <laughs> all you do is read and, and you don't want to do anything else. And so when, when I got pregnant with my firstborn, she was like all ready with a squad to come and rescue this poor baby from, you know, this person who would clearly be inept at, at raising children. So um, which th that tells you too, you can be maternal, not be maternal, and, and it sort of comes along. But anyway, I always wanted to do law. Uh, when I was younger, I thought there's a profession where you get paid to read. Fantastic. That's, the <laughs> that's it for me. And then I, I, uh, I don't age myself or anything like that. But um, I was in, remember fairly vividly the 90s, uh, the fight for multi party and, and a lot of people being imprisoned. And the people at the forefront at that time for that struggle were lawyers, right? So you had Paul Muite, uh, Gitobe Manyara, 
Martha Karua, and, and the sense of lawyers as sort of at the forefront of justice and democracy and leadership was something that struck me as a young person. And so law was, I thought I was going to law school to change the world um, until you get to law school and you realize lawyers don't really change the world. Um, but when I was there, at, 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 when I was at Harvard, I, because there was not much being offered, then I thought I was gonna be an international human rights lawyer. In fact, I took a class with Ocampo who was lecturing and he just left to go head up uh, the ICC after that and I was like, fantastic, I'll even go intern under him and then you realize international human rights is not really what you think it is. Um, and I needed a home for my passion about Africa. And the Berkman Center became my home because at that time, Ethan Zuckerman, Andrew McLaughlin, a lot of Afrophiles were at the Berkman Center then. And it became my avenue for mixing my experience at Harvard Law School with Africa. So my consistency has always been passion about Africa and passion about Kenya. Um, and I ended up getting more into te technology that way because it was the only Africa angle I could find at, at Harvard. Um, my first internship was at the CCK uh, when I was in law school. At that time, um, what was his name? The crazy minister, the late, uh, the seatbelt guy. Uh, Mishuki. Uh, Mishuki had banned Skype. Uh, this was in 2003. Uh, he had banned Skype and Wi-Fi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in 2003, and Demo had just joined the ministry, and he was a, a, in a small office at Taram, uh, Harambe House, and I remember I hunted him down, I found his, even then he always answered his emails, Bitangi at Jumbo, the COK. I found his email via Skunkworks, and I hunted him down, and through him and a few others got contacts and ended up at the CCK. Uh, doing, I spent my summer there, half of my summer with them and the other half with the World Bank. Uh, came back again and did more work around tech and regulation, helping the government understand that Wi-Fi is not a bad thing. Um, and you know, at, at that time, Wi-Fi was banned because it was a military frequency and the military was refusing to let it go. Um, and based on my experience that summer, you know, the guys at Berkman were like, you should blog about technology and your experiences, and that's how I got into blogging. Um, and my passions sort of began merging around tech. Blogging became a great platform for me to express myself on issues I cared about, and I ended up getting more into the politics side of things uh, then. So it's sort of a meandering journey where a lot of these things converged, where law became a way for me to see how can we change policy and regulation around technology in Kenya and in Africa then. Um, and you know, tech and blogging became a platform for me to express myself and meet other diaspora. Uh, Kenyans, I remember, I don't know if he's here, mental, uh, 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 Daudi, where we became the first two sort of Kenyan go-to places where I would hunt down bloggers. I would get people to blog, Limo, Bankelele, Conrad, he used to have this um, thinker's room uh, this geocity, yeah, the geocities, no, it was a, a, a static website, and I thought, this guy is so hilarious, he should blog. I found him, and I, that's how we became friends. I went, I bought him coffee, and I'm like, have you thought about blogging? Um, you know, I did the first bloggers meetup with three guys, me and Ashok, and one other person at Choices was the first, like, Kenyan bloggers meetup, and it grew after that. Um, and so tech became sort of an interesting for me, when I saw um, blogging at that time in particular, a way for young Africans to express themselves without intermediaries, right? And people would write about sex and about cooking and about Formula One and all that, and content that was not really accessible to people before that, and then there was always the political angle. Um, but then after law school, you know, then they're like, okay, I'm tired of being broke, I need to get paid. Uh, and there was a huge tension between the job offer that I had in DC where it summered and the things that were driving and animating me. So the plan was to come back for a year and set up a base that then I would go back to the US and, you know, make some money um, 
and then come back and really do what I wanted to do. But then I ended up here and never really left. Um, and I'm glad. And this was before Africa Rising, guys. This was 2005, uh, where everyone thought, like, what are you doing? Crazy. My, my family was, like, clearly, s you went to Harvard Law School, and now you're blogging and doing what exactly? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'd interned. So I always split my summers. And, and this is sort of a lesson for those who are wondering how did I build my network and how do, do I know everyone so well. Matiangi, the current minister, was my first internship, my first internship in Kenya as an undergrad. He was my boss. Uh, so I can still call him up today and like, you know, like we go way back. So I always split my summers between Kenya, the whole time I was in the US, between Kenya and the US. And so my network of people, people who've known me from when I was getting started and hustling to do all sorts of little crazy ideas that I had even back then. Um, so I'd split my last summer with the Kenya National Human Rights Commission with my Nakiai, and so I landed in 2005, okay, I'm like, I don't have a job kind of thing, make something happen. And Willie Mutunga was at Ford Foundation then. And so we approached him and came up with a fellowship uh, for me to spend a year with the Kenya National Human Rights Commission. And I developed the economic and social rights program and then worked on the referendum in 2005. Uh, and then met my husband somewhere in between then and he sort of, conned me into moving to Johannesburg uh, with him. But that's, the path is meandering, but always if there's a consistent story, is my passion for my country, my passion for the region, wanting to make things happen. Um, I, I remember doing an interview a few, when I was at Google with Forbes, um, Fonobong did a piece about me and he's like, your epitaph, w what would it read? And I said, she did stuff. Uh, <laughs> so that finding ways to make those things come together has driven me. And I have found, even though I made a lot of decisions, I would just close my eyes and, you know, when I quit my job to do Shahidi full time with a young baby, not knowing you know, where income was gonna come from. It's just a lot of closing eyes and saying, look, if I do what I love, the rest of it will follow. It's taken a long time <laughs> uh, for everything to merge together, but I have found that to be uh, really true. Like, you know, I've followed my passion and everything else has come together. Um, and sometimes not always the easiest decisions, but not a single moment of regret. So could you, could you actually give us a feel of how those, those the tough decisions um, that you had to make and um, how they actually came to shape you and, and looking back with hindsight, definitely, um, you're grateful for, for going through such decisions? Um, yeah, <laughs> there, there are a number of them. I think on, on a personal level, um, I, re I remember when I was sort of, you know, doing the back and forth between Nairobi and Johannesburg. And, you know, my husband and I both sucked at long distance relationships. So we're like, okay, someone has to move. And that someone was me, because he was pretty established there. Um, and I remember thinking, this is the antithesis of everything that a young, educated, you know, Harvard lawyer is about moving to some country for some guy <laughs> <laughs> with like no plan, um, you know, was, was like every, went against every sort of thing that you had been working to position yourself as this young black power woman, whatever. And so I'm moving for some guy. In fact, I, I tell when I speak to young men, it's like for the first three years, our arguments always ended up with some big, sort of, do you know I moved? <laughs> Even if it was tangential to like any, <laughs> to what we're arguing about, it would be like, I, you know. Um, so that was, it went against, I mean it was, it went against sort of 
what you're expected to sort of position, you know, work, build your career, make your money, and then maybe find some guy somewhere, you know, along the way. But that's not your, your, your primary thing. Um, and so following my heart was not something, I'm a lot, you know, I'm like logic, risk averse, like all those things. And here I was taking a risk and following my heart. Um, and it was an eye opener for me. And I think uh, it's, it's something women don't use enough is sort of their instinct and going with their gut sometimes. Uh, and it's, it's made me trust my gut a lot more down the line. Uh, but at that time, it wasn't the obvious decision. It took me a long time to re jig myself in South Africa. They wanted me to go back to school before I could practice. Um, I was like, no, I've just done the bar exam. It's not happening. Um, it's very close network. Um, I had to start from scratch. I was like sending out resumes and I had the job offer waiting for me. You know, like it was very humbling. I interviewed with McKinsey, like that's how desperate I was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly, you, you feel me, uh, it, it, you know, and I had to do like some modeling, something as I was going through, the, I'm like, what am I doing, you know, um, so that sort of having to start from scratch, you know, when you, just when you think you've reached Harvard Law, whatever, and you're back here sending resumes, and you have loans, and all these things, was a, a test for me. So on the personal side, I think that's one example where it worked out. And now it looks fantastic, you know, three beautiful kids, and you know, it's very great. But there was a few <laughs> very uh, testing times, and I'd just be like, I'm this, why am I here? I'm gonna fly back next week, whatever. <laughs> um, so that's one example. I think another, uh, when was that? I finally got traction, finally got some consulting work, also practicing as a lawyer. Ended up in the right sort of what I thought was a good trajectory. Uh, then post election violence happened when we were here on, on holiday, and we uh, should be came out of that and um, you know, came up with an idea on the flight back to Johannesburg. I didn't want to leave. Um, and I was here when my first born was 10 months old. And uh, you know, my husband had sort of been I was live blogging the situation then and I was like, I need to keep telling the story. You know, it doesn't make sense for me to go back to Joburg. And I was like, why don't you guys go back to Johannesburg? And then uh, you know, once things quieten down, this is like early Jan. Because everyone thought maybe another two weeks and then it will ease off. And like once things quieten down, I'll the next flight, and he's like, either we all stay or we all go. Um, and that decision to be for me was really hard because I felt like I was playing a role here, uh, and like I was sort of abandoning things to, 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 to go back. Um, and so the idea of the came to all the flight back. I'm like, okay, so what can I do? that can keep the story going. And it was also getting inefficient for me to comment all the stories that people were sending them to me. And if I didn't blog for two hours, everybody would be like, where are you, are you okay, <laughs> whatever. And so to go back and say, uh, you know, blogged about the idea and Eric got in touch with me and dated and as the idea came what it was and it started growing up and then it was clearly the momentum and then the xenophobic violence happened in South Africa just about the same time. And the realization of we were onto something, this would be something bigger, uh, but he needed full time dedication and work and whatever. And, you know, that's you're just getting traction professionally, you're work, you know, becoming a real lawyer, uh, then having to quit and, and say, okay, let's look for some money uh, <laughs> for this thing. And I said, as soon as we won the first 25,000 net square competition, I said, okay, maybe this, well, let's quit that can pay us for a few months. Uh, and then hustled to get our first um, funding for Humanity United. So that didn't seem like a very rational thing at the time. And, um, Again, a testament to sort of saying, okay, fine, this 
could be something you're passionate about this. Uh, you just trust that it will work itself out in the end. And it was not something very natural to me as well. Entrepreneurship, you know, again, I'm a lawyer, risk averse, whatever, and now you're founding, co founding, uh, was not an easy decision. Uh, I know we very rough times in the first year when we'd be like, Usha, 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 Usha Didi, Usha. <laughs> what is this thing? And you know, now telling my mom that I'm doing a crowdsourcing application, roadmap, whatever. And it doesn't make money, you know. <laughs> uh, and it's open source, and so we're giving it away for free. And everyone would be like, oh my god, this thing, you should monetize it. Why are you not selling it? The all sorts of pressures around that and what it should become and could be and just making the decision to be about serving people and helping people and keeping it open source and building community around it was not always the most natural sort of decision back, especially when you're broke uh, with a 10 month old and then my second born was born like our second year. Uh, so I was running around fundraising when I was pregnant, which was maybe not necessarily a bad strategy. <laughs> My child needs to eat uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, those were some of like the, the stories that when you read the glossy profiles and you know, those are some of the tough decisions and stories that are not always there. Um, and it's, it's not an easy journey, I'd say, particularly on the entrepreneurship side. Okay, and um, I think let's dive into the entrepreneurship side. Uh, for starters, uh, you, you, you embark on the journey of um, Zalendo and then now Ushahidi. So um, most, mo if you look at them, clearly they're, they're mostly on, on, on social issues and, and you take an approach of non-governmental, really for profit in these ventures. So uh, could you just take us through that process of how you guys came to, to found all through and what is your overall vision that, you, that, that you're casting or that you, uh, you as a team uh, set upon um, in, in, in all that you started you know, while, while you were doing it? Yeah. Um, so, so much to my family's dismay, that, that, like w one day we hope you form a for-profit <laughs> venture and make some money. So I'm, I'm working on that. Um, I think the journey, there was never sort of a sitting down and sketching out and this is the business plan thing other than I, I always tell entrepreneurs, it's about scratching an itch that you have, right? So that was always the starting point. There's a problem with, with Mzalendo, uh, Conrad and I had been blogging about politicians for a while in, in sort of the acerbic way that we do. And we're like, okay, we're tired of noise making and we're, we're no better than them if we're not doing something about it. But the trigger was when parliament took their, their website down. Remember after Ngilu complained that guys were making fun of the fact that she had a high school uh, only level. So they took the website down, uh, but they, fo they left the mirror up, right? And so like, ah, these guys think they're being clever. So we scraped the mirror. Because uh, <laughs> we're like, it's ridiculous that we can't have the parliament website up. So that was how Mzalendo sort of started. We're like, okay, let's collect all this info and put it back up. Um, and let's see if they come after us, which they didn't. And that when you're younger, you sort of want people to come after you as well. I was like, <laughs> if they arrest us, fantastic. Then people know about the website. Um, and then we sort of didn't really want to get funded um, also initially, because we're worried about people affecting our agenda and how we do things. and having to worry about your orientation. So Mzalendo, I think, got, so we figured out, well, we need the domain and the hosting. Um, and then we literally did everything ourselves. And we were working at the time. We're doing, wasn't a full-time thing. So I mean, I remember manually, and Conrad is here doing like data entry, like all the data, all the collating of information. I used to go hang out with parliament interns uh, and buy them coffee, and so they, you know, become the hook us up with stuff like handsets. It was illegal to have the handset online then, 
Um, so they'd hook me up with like copies of the Hansard in Word that, <laughs> that we would then put up. Like all sorts of things, you know. The, one of the surgeon at arms then became a friend of mine. He's now like a big wig in parliament and um, always used to leak stuff to me and, and give us stuff like that. Um, so that one was a labor of love, really, rather than an enterprise or an org or a business. Uh, our first funding, I think, came after we were like five years in. And even then, we struggled to spend it because we're like so scared about hiring people and then having to spend so much time chasing funding and diluting the core of what we were. Um, because then funders wanted us to be an organization so that if we got sued, it wasn't us as individuals getting sued, it would be the organization um, and so on. So we, we grew organically and then we're like, okay, we need someone to do the content full time, so we got a bit of funding for that. Um, and we needed someone to help with data entry, we got a bit of funding for that. And only last year did we finally sort of let go and say, okay, Zalendo is on its own with a team that's fundraising, whatever. Um, but very much a labor of love, which was great in one hand, but also I think limited um, how big the organization could grow. I think we ended up open sourcing the code thanks to my society two years ago where now there's a shine your eye in Nigeria that's built off the Mzalendo code. Uh, there's something in Zim, there's something in South Africa that's just launched, all built on Mzalendo code being replicated, I think, in Egypt, in Tunisia, X number of countries, um, which maybe if we had done earlier, perhaps, we'd have seen more of this in other countries, but that was a very different model. I think I went into Ushahidi sort of with a different mindset of building an institutional organization that I could walk away from and it's fine. And that's what's happened, right? And so, again, they're similarly driven by passion and interest and we're responding to a crisis. But with the team, then with Eric and Julian and Dave, it was always about a platform that can grow with the community and not necessarily depend on the four individuals at the core. So those are the different sort of models that, uh, that I've experienced. Um, and I think for me, even if I was to ever do a for profit somewhere down the, the line, the starting point will always be, is there a problem that needs to be solved? Um, and is it something, because w when you're running an enterprise as entrepreneurs, you're, it's like another baby, right? Um, like you don't stop thinking about it, you don't stop worrying about payroll, the next funding round, issues, managing people, whatever. And so you have to really feel it, uh, I think, to sustain the times that are really difficult. And so I've been lucky that I've founded stuff that I care about that was never really like, even when things were not particularly going well or we hit a rough patch, uh, there was never any question about why am I doing this or what value is it or this is, is too hard but it's, it's worth it. Um, so, I, I guess in, in, in that sense, nonprofit only because um, that's where my interest has been. And I need, it needs to be something that I really feel, otherwise it's, you know, mm. it's not, when things are tough, it becomes easy to walk away when you're not very passionate about what you're doing. Okay, so then how would you start explaining the fact that um, you, you um, you've built, you've, you've clearly led in these different organizations and, and you now venture into, into now the, the profit side, which is Google, and, and in a position of policy and the likes. What, what was it that actually led to you going to Google and you selecting that company? Was it the pressures of the family saying, where's the money now? Or, uh, <laughs> 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 or what, what, what exactly? Um. So, so a number of things. I think one, uh, I was nervous about being pigeonholed as the Ushahidi person, um, which, you know, that works for some founders wanting to be that thing for the rest of their life. For me, Ushahid, I didn't sort of grow up, I mean, that wasn't like my lifelong 
dreamer. So I was worried about being pigeonholed into, into one thing. Um, and I was getting sort of antsy about, you know, three years down the road. In the beginning, I was, you know, close to the back end, to the community, and I, I felt like as we were growing bigger, the things that excited, I was doing more admin and more board meetings and more uh, the distance between the stuff that I was passionate about w was was growing, right? And it was more just more admin driven and more sort of growing and scaling, but too distant from the stuff that I enjoyed. I enjoyed meeting with the devs. I enjoyed working. You know, I was like the test person for a long time because I'm not really a coder or whatever. So I'd be like the UX, <laughs> the, the UX person. Uh, for features and stuff like that, it, you know, so the distance between that was growing. Um, it, and with a young family as well, I think um, I wanted to have one more child, my third born. And the, the pressures of sort of a 24-7 venture um, were getting to me. I was burnt out. And I was like, well, maybe, you know, <laughs> I shouldn't have gone to Google if that was what I was looking for. Uh, but something where, you know, that, that if, if you don't meet payroll, like it's not, it's not your problem, <laughs> in a sense, you know what I mean? Uh, and it, it, you know, as, as long as you're performing and doing what you, what you want, uh, I mean, what, not what you want, like you're within your role, you're doing well. I, I needed a break. I needed to sort of step back and, and we think so that was part of it and I think also within I'd always be sort of saying Google should do this Google should do that Google should and they're like okay fine come and tell <laughs> since you have all these big ideas of what Google should be doing here's a platform for for making that happen um, so it was a mix of different things one something different to the role itself was perfect for me because it combined sort of my legal background my policy background I had not had much work experience within Africa. Uh, and so I loved the fact that I was in Senegal, I was in uh, you know, Mozambique, Nigeria, all these countries that I'd never been to, building, getting to travel within Africa, meeting communities. You know, I was also worried about that Kenya being so narrow about Kenya and, and, and maybe South Africa and, and thinking that stuck in Africa. And it was such an eye opener. Um, to experience other cities and other tech communities and build relationships across the continent. So the opportunity was also exciting for me. Um, and I think one of the lessons um, uh, sort of with Ushahidi was just realizing that I didn't really have experience as, you know, in a business. And I wanted to see how do you grow a culture? How do you scale? How do you get to the point where in every Google office is the same kind of people, the same, and more like whether you're the Google office in Tel Aviv, Google office in Johannesburg, I see a few Googlers here, they know what I'm talking about, where how do you get to 28,000 people and still retain that sense of culture? Because it was something, when you're a young company, your biggest asset is your people, right? And your culture. And I felt like I'd wanted to learn more about scaling organizations because that was, uh, I think, a weak skill on my part. Scaling organizations, growing people, building and maintaining that where the 20th person you bring on, you know, it's easy when you're small, but as the 25th person, you start to lose that, the 40th, the 100th, where they come in and they join and they know what the company is about, how you work, how you do. And so Google, for me, was the best place to experience that and to see how they do it. Okay, and um, so you 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 leave Google and and um, and now head on to investing, investing in startups, right? Yes. And um, you made a few investments, I believe, by now because yes. it's a year. Yes. And um, how's the journey been? And why did you actually? Um, and most of the, like, if you look at the investments um, that you've done, they clearly put it on the Omidia website. Um, is 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 mostly towards transparency and government uh, initiatives and um, again non for profit. <laughs> yes. um, so so uh, why did you move to Omidia? And then secondly, uh, what is it that you're trying to achieve while you're while you're there? Um, so a number of things. I think o Omidia I've known for a long time. They were funders of of uh, Ushahidi. 
um, and they were looking to grow their physical presence in, in Africa before they, most of their investments were out of California and then London. Um, and one thing I saw while at Google and over the last three or four years was a growing number of investment funds, private equity, VCs coming to the continent looking for sort of uh, opportunities and um, ways to take advantage of things, whether it's tech, energy, agribusiness, whatever. So one, um, and th when you looked at who the gatekeepers and the intermediaries were, a lot of times it's, you know, invest it's changing in particular over the last two years, but there's still, um, you know, investments being done out of London, out of New York, out of wherever, and I'm like, well, what's wrong with this picture? If, if we have the local knowledge, we understand the market, we know the companies, uh, and the gatekeepers for most of these funds end up not being Africans, which was really bothering me. You know, you'd go to a PE conference, a VC investing in Africa conference, and, and you look at <laughs> the profile of who's there, and it doesn't really match with what. So one was saying, if this is a growing opportunity to the extent that I have networks, to the extent that I have access to entrepreneurs, building some experience in investing was interesting to me. Uh, but I didn't want to just do it with anyone, it's with an organization that I know. I did feel, um, if you look at a lot of the issues, what, so why governance and transparency? One, uh, that was the role. They would like me to do more, but I, like one step at a time. Um, a lot of the challenges, there's, you know, Africa growing, Africa rising, and all this good stuff, but fundamentally we still have issues around leadership. We still have issues around, look at Kenya now. We're, we're going back to fighting wars that we thought were sorted in, 19, in 2002. Closing space for media, closing space for civil society, um, Nigeria, same thing. Uh, governments trying to think that they're sort of fooling us in terms of how they're doing things. So, so I worry that there's a closing space on the governance side, on the transparency side, uh, but I need for new tactics as well. So what I'm not seeing, you know, if I look at most Kenyan civil society, still that same tactic of let's hold a press conference at the Stanley to strongly condemn, uh, <laughs> you know, what's happening in Kasarani. Uh, like that also needs to change, right? Uh, we're dealing with a stavia governments, you know, so there's a perception of free expression in Kenya. Uh, but, I mean, ask any media house how many calls they're getting from state house to kill stories. It's not funny, right? And so thinking about how do you tackle that, uh, and tech allows you to do that. Maybe do we need more online independent media? Do we need a different kind of activism? Do we need new political parties? Do like there's a need to rethink how we address some of these issues. And so for me, that's an interesting challenge. Um, and how can we as funders, not just as Owen, whether it's Hivos or anyone who's looking at this civic space, um, support a new kind of thinking and approach to it. Uh, although I'm not trying to overthrow governments. <laughs> I, might, I, I might be the next sort of uh, suspect on that list. But what we also do for profit around civic um, innovation, right? And, and we fund things like tech hubs. Um, I'm looking to fund for-profit civic innovation. So you could be a for-profit media or content play that I'd be interested in. I'm looking at tech more broadly as well. And Omedia itself does investments in education, financial inclusion, consumer internet mobile, uh, which they have an interest in driving opportunities in those sectors I'm able to. But for the short term, I think I see the need, uh, particularly Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria, for a different kind of thinking around civic engagement and civic innovation. And it's a challenge, and that's exciting for me. Um, so if you come back home, and home I mean Africa, so um, pretty much Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the startups that we have um, currently, the various, the multiple startups, what do you see is uh, 
inhibiting them from, from um, striking that level of profitability or sustainability um, or something else? Or what do you think is actually inhibiting, inhibiting them from achieving that? Um, so, I'd, I mean, I have insight into the three different markets, and this was something I saw also when, when I was at Google. Uh, and they're very different challenges. I think what South Africa does really well uh, is, is the creative kind of thinking around business opportunities, uh, around gaps, and around how they design businesses. I think it's, it's no coincidence that you have your Elon Musk, your Shuttleworth, uh, and all these guys who are South African, like we, for, we forget that, like big, the big transformative ideas and has something to do with their school, their schooling. We call the academics, uh, so we struggle with that as Kenyan parents. We're like, but what number is she, you know, uh, <laughs> which is a very Kenyan thing, um, but very well rounded and, and a huge value for, the cr for creatives. And you see that feeding into, and we think of, in Kenya, creatives are just artists and music and whatever, but it's also a huge part of entrepreneurship. It affects design, it affects the quality of apps that you see coming out, it affects advertising. So you can actually have a tech business that runs on advertising in South Africa because there is a lot of digital advertising, right? Um, and because they value all these things, you know, Hosting a World Cup for them was not just about the buildings and the stadiums. It was about the quality of productions, the quality of concerts that you could put there. And this nurturing of the creative space and the sports space gives them an edge in terms of they're able to think bigger and bolder in a way that we're too, you know, if you look at Kenya, we're still too conservative uh, in our approach and our thinking. And, and so they have that as the advantage. What we have that they struggle with is um, as a consumer population, particularly in the tech space, your end user here is willing to experiment with things a lot faster uh, and test things out. And, and, and so if, we were if we're thinking bolder and bigger, we have the market here that can grab that very quickly and run with it, whereas they have a very conservative sort of market that they're serving. Um, I think Nigeria, everyone always says, well, they have the numbers and, and, and that sort of thing, but I don't think that's it. I think what I see there, um, you know, they're struggling more with a sense of community that we are very strong with, but the entrepreneurs are very focused on making money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, so I'm seeing a lot more revenue positive, not maybe profitable, but if I compare it to Kenya, like a lot of the startups there are revenue positive very early. Um, and even they're getting a lot smarter and a lot savvier about niches and doing hard things. And I think because they're forced to work in an environment that is so power, there's no power, there's no this, there's the payments, they're discriminated against in terms of payments, in terms of security, whatever. It's forcing them uh, to be a lot sharper in the tech space uh, and a lot savvier in a way that maybe we're too cushioned uh, in, in, in this community. So there, there are variations. Um, I think I see across the board, if you look at your congas and, you know, everyone thought you can never do e-commerce. How do you do e-commerce in Nigeria? You know, how do you solve payments? How do you solve logistics? How do you solve, but they're doing it and doing really well. Um, so that trend towards tackling the hard decisions, um, I mean, tackling the hard problems, they're, I think, taking off where I see us looking for the safer, you know, uh, with a few exceptions, sort of the safer challenge, you know, issues. Um, and it might hurt us, Kenya in particular, in the long run. So we had the momentum, but we might lose it because we're getting to, if I look at where the interesting companies are, it's West Africa, Southern Africa. Zim is a place to watch, I think. Mugabe is not going to live forever. <laughs> and <laughs> at worst, and if that turns around, they have all the elements there. And because they're used to, again, working in very tough environments, very negative environments, um, we need to be careful not to lose our edge. Um, yeah, but I think, 
you know, it's, we had this conversation earlier and, and, and I said, I look around, I see so many pain points here that we're not addressing. Um, you know, Uber wants to come here and I'm like, no, what we need is like border border plus task rabbit, you know, <laughs> sort of thing. Or if um, your cab guy is sitting here waiting for you to leave IHUB, in the, why can't he run a few errands or drop, do a few drop-offs that an app that tells him actually for the three hours, instead of sitting waiting in your car, uh, there are like two or three clients that you can service and then come back. You know, those, there are many local issues and challenges that we're not solving for. Uh, and I think too much of a focus on consumer, and I rant about this on Twitter all the time, and not B2B. So if you look at the interesting tech companies that are here, unfortunately, as Owen, we are also too focused on consumer. Uh, the B2B space, one, it gets you paid. Two, the, as the economies are growing, there are so many SMEs with logistics problems, payroll, where am I pirating pastel or whatever. Uh, if someone could build me an app that I, or a solution that I pay 20,000 shillings for a month, uh, and I'd like to see sitting here, actually, you should be interviewing more SME owners rather than other techies, because there's almost too much incestuousness, whatever, and, and, and not enough uh, connecting with wider business communities. Nigeria has started doing that now. I spoke there a few months ago, and I, the challenge I put to CC Hub, I'm like, your next speakers should just be head of UBA, head of uh, not MTN, not other tech companies, get a Wando PLC. They're in 10 countries. I'm sure they have tech challenges. Get the you know, CTO of Wando to come and sit here and tell you what his issues are. Get the CEO of Dangote, oh no, of City of Dangote to come and tell you who does their tech as they spread, if they're coming into Kenya, who's doing their tech. That, you know, like too much of rah, rah, rah within the tech and, and ignoring real problems that can get you paid. Uh, key, <laughs> get you paid. There's nothing wrong with that uh, outside of enterprise. It's not sexy. It's not going to get you X number of downloads. It might not even get you profiled in First Company and all these big magazines, but it will get you paid and give you a platform to do other things. Um, that's the gap that I see. The economies are growing, but we're not positioning ourselves as a tech community to serve oil and gas, logistics, energy. Those guys all have big tech issues and challenges. Do we know what they are? Not really. Uh, and I'd like to see an orientation towards bringing more business and tech to give opportunities to the young tech is to do stuff that actually gets them paid and not demotivated with an app that no one is downloading or that no one is paying for. Um, so in closing, um, I think uh, back, back, uh, before we hand it over to the audience to ask questions, um, one of the, um, like, like what, when, when you turn 80, what do you want the chaps uh, around you? Your kids will be taking care of you probably. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, never turn 80. Uh, <laughs> yeah, about you. I, mean, it's, it's, I answered it before. I, I think I just want to be remembered as someone who did stuff. You know, I, I. My husband is, is sitting here. He'll tell you. I, I find it hard to sort of sit and, and and see a gap or problem and not find a way to address it. And and people. I want to be known for making connections, for solving problems, for helping other people, a legacy, I guess, and where if people are speaking about me at my memorial, there'd be a room full of people who have an anecdote that told you how I connected, made something happen. Uh, Googlers will tell you that I was really famous for that all over the show, just connecting people, making things happen, networks, you know, getting stuff done, finding $5,000 here to make this happen here, seeding stuff. Um, you know, and as an, I see myself as an engaged citizen of the world, and, and so the, the, what I want my kids to pick up from that is, is that they just need to be engaged citizens of the world. That if they see something that can get up 
and do it and, and solve it and, and not sit around and, and wait for stuff to happen around them. And I, I'm, I'm sure at 80 I'll still be doing that, probably meddling in their lives a little bit too much. Um, but I, I see myself even 90 or whatever, just being engaged, learning, helping, solving, um, you know, and, and giving back, um, in, in particularly to a country and a continent that's been very good to me. Um, you know, seeing how can I always get us, you know, how can I always give back and help make things hap happen for other people in particular. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, please let's give a round of applause to <laughs> Ori Okolo. And um, I just general Q&A, you can ask her the hard questions, in fact. <laughs> and uh, who would like to start? I was just having this discussion with, uh, uh, I don't know whether Zach Mukewa is here from the Nyla, and the discussion was really on all the sort of competitions that are there. There are really women who are in that. And I just wanted your thoughts on what you think could be the cause and what can be done to change that. So I think it's an issue that's perennial for women in any environment that's competitive, um, is that we think we need to be perfect uh, to pitch and to put stuff together. And so we feel our idea is not good enough or, um, you know, ju just we eliminate ourselves <laughs> even before the competition, right? Um, and And... From my experience, how do you solve that? I think one, to the extent you have an idea, getting one, not thinking that it should be perfect before you pitch. Uh, two, I think finding a male mentor uh, is important because they, they're like, ah, this thing, you know, don't worry about that. Just getting that positive feedback or understanding how they would think about it has, is very helpful. Um, you, you know, f I used to be a terrible negotiator, probably I still am, because I suffer from those sort of eliminating of trying to overperfect whatever. So I run some of my negotiations either th through my husband or a male friend. And he's like, what? You know, that's great. Like, I would ask for this. And I'm like, really? Uh, y you know, just... The psychological barrier, I think, is the biggest one. So partnering with someone who can help you build up your confidence to address that. Uh, and it's not just in competitions, it's business ideas, how much you think you should get, how much, you think, how much funding you think you should ask for, and so on. You're always second guessing. Um, so if run it by someone who can validate it for you, and also just do it and failing, and failure is not the end of the world, not winning is not the end, that's the other thing, like we'll enter a competition, have a bad experience, and we'll be like, oh, okay, 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 that's not for me. Whereas a guy will be like, okay, fine, the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, until inevitably you get better at pitching, you, your idea gets refined, you pivot, you whatever, so not giving up too quickly and not eliminating yourself even before it starts. I'm not a fan of sort of women-only competitions. I think that competing with, every, you know, that's the only way you'll get better, so I don't think that's a solution. I do think creating a space where women can learn from other successful women is important. Um, you know, and in Kenya particularly, we have maybe not many tech female entrepreneurs, but many strong women entrepreneurs in other spaces that we should be learning from. Uh, look at Dorothy Getuba with uh, Spillworks. You know, very <laughs> amazing story. Why aren't we then engaging with her 
and learning how she's built a strong content business as a young woman. Uh, maybe not tech, but she's an entrepreneur with lessons to learn. Gina Dean, Cynthia Nyama, there are all these women who are coming up and building solid enterprises, and maybe we shouldn't silo ourselves in terms of who we learn from. It doesn't have to be from another female tech person. Uh, it can be any female entrepreneur who has lessons to share. And there are many amazing women at, at Speak for Kenya right now building big businesses very quietly uh, and killing it in, in, in their markets that we should then be learning from. Anybody else? Questions, questions? Thank you, Ori. My name is Obejam from Uganda. Well, I find the theme of jobs and uh, unemployment quite constant in many, not, not far people, but at least from close friends. In your opinion, where is the real problem? Is it education? Is it individuals? Is it governments? What should we do better? That's, uh, there's, there's no easy answer uh, to that. I, I think in the region, different countries have different issues. So South Africa, there's definitely a skills education issue there. Um, Kenya tends to be, it's, some of it could be government policy, some of it could be, uh, when you talk to entrepreneurs, when you talk to medium-sized companies that are really growing, everyone is struggling to find good talent, right? Uh, so it tells me there's something about, not just from our skills, but also from an individual and attitudes in terms of where people think they want to start from <laughs> versus, so th th there's a bit of a short-term thinking thing going on um, where everyone thinks they should start at the top and no one wants to, for certain jobs, I think. Um, I think we've, we, it was a mistake from a government policy perspective across all African countries to give up on vocational and technical schools. Huge mistake. So if there was one magic bullet thing, it would be to go back to polytechnics and vocational. Uh, because GE wants to set up a plant here, they can't get welders. Um, they're trying to set up in Angola, they can't get people who can run process in manufacturing. Too low is the too low whatever oil, where are they bringing guys from Australia here to run drilling? Uh, so we, we, no one wants to do, make, to do stuff involving making and, but that's where the jobs and the opportunities are, manufacturing, building, welding, plumbing, all these buildings that are coming up, uh, construction, and we've given, we have not invested enough in those skills that can then capture. So magic bullet, I think, the gaps are in technical and manufacturing and we're not positioned for that. Uh, and it's going to hurt us tremendously. But magic, if we're to go back and invest in vocational apprentice, uh, in making stuff, things, um, and, and taking, not everyone can sit in an office, and not everyone should sit in an office. Uh, we've oriented towards office jobs, which they're not, they're just not enough. And it's not what will grow the economy either, right? Uh, farming, agribusiness. You know, we don't have extension officers, like they're having, Artificial, in, there are no, there are, you know the biggest gap, one of the biggest gaps in agriculture right now here, there are not enough artificial, remember artificial insemination officers? They're like I think two or something, three, which is affecting the breeds of our cows uh, because they're no experts in that, you know, no one is talking about that, no one is saying, well, go to school to become an agriculture extension officer or artificial insemination, right? You all, <laughs> but the, the, the gap is there. Um, so reorienting to go back to some of those things that around agriculture, manufacturing, trades, skills, um, is where the gap is, I think. Okay, the last two questions. Uh, who? Hi, my name is Kate. 
Um, I have a question regarding, right now, one of the biggest pain points in our country is insecurity and terrorism. So what are your thoughts on using biometric systems to identify refugees, for example, in a country, to be able to protect citizens at the same time as knowing which are the legal refugees? And in terms of platforms like Oshahidi and CrowdMap, how, in your view, could it be used to help tackle insecurity? And if a startup was to come up with a solution to use technology for it, would you be interested in funding such a startup? <laughs> so that's where the question was going. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the only problem is uh, with that is that our insecurity problem is not a technology problem. Uh, it's a corruption problem. And no amount of sophisticated biometric system or app or crowdsourcing will help if we have officers who are still taking money to let people into borders, if we have corrupt foreign affairs, if you have cops who, when you report the illegal person, take bribes, um, you, you know, and on and on. If you have judges who throw the case, you have people out on bail who then find their way back to Somalia. So th the problem is not really a technology problem, and we all know that. It's a values problem, it's a corruption problem, it's all these things we've neglected over the years coming back to bite us in the behind. A uh, bit of a leadership problem as well, but you know, and a president who doesn't stay in the country, but uh, <laughs> I won't go into that. Um, but no, really, f fundamentally, is you, you can do digital IDs and do look at, you know, or, or any sort of thing, but if we don't tackle that, if there are no consequences for impunity, for corruption, um, no amount of technology will, will solve that. So if you build an app that solves that, <laughs> uh, make us less corrupt, I, I would consider <laughs> investing in that. <laughs> Would you ever join politics? Be our leader because you sound like you have some kick ass policies. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's, what's the political way to answer this? Uh, <laughs> nothing is foreclosed <laughs> in the future. Um, I don't know, would, would I become a politician? I don't know, but I think public service is important. Um, uh, and, and it's something I've done in, I've tried to participate in various ways, uh, even at Google, even now with Omedia, trying to see ways that we can engage with government and not just entrepreneurs. Um, so yes, I, I mean, I, I, I will definitely at some point uh, participate in public service in some shape or form. Uh, I think it's important, I think, to the extent that you're able uh, and willing, uh, giving back to your country or engaging or trying to solve problems from the inside and not always throwing stones from the outside uh, is important. Um, so, short, not politician, I don't know, but, but definitely public service. Last question. Thanks for a great talk. My name is Gaviru, and I'm in oil, gas, and mining. I'm um, very pleased that you mentioned uh, a couple of things. One, a big word, incestuousness. I'll remember that. I think we need a lot more cross-pollination. And uh, I just want to pick your brains a little bit. I believe that Kenya will be driven by the extractive sector. Where should techies play? Um, I'll take one more question from her as well. Um, OK, so and I'll keep it short so that you have time for, for your question. I think logistics 
is going to be critical, right? So if you look at where the extractives are happening are places that are remote. So how do you pay workers there? How do you send goods there? How do you manage all those little transactions that enable a big sort of oil and gas operation to happen? Uh, you know, M-Pesa is one, but there are all sorts of little things along the way that I think around logistics that uh, that could provide opportunities. I think understanding business processes. Um, I'm not an oil and so this is just my guess, uh, back of the envelope guess. I think business processes is one. Um, inevitably, these things tend to be um, cross-border and cross- uh, if you're sitting there, how do you get your stuff out? How do you engage? How do you manage? Pay? Like business process logistics, I think, are the two. Perhaps drilling and the tech around that, but I don't think we're there yet. What I would say is what you do need to be having is not, or not hackathons or whatever. It's just coming and sitting with all the big oil companies that are coming in and, and telling them what are, are your pain points, what are your gaps, and how can we service them. Uh, the companies that are well positioned to do that, you know, S South Africa has done really well with Sasol, for instance, uh, building a company that's so good at what it does that, you know, Sasol is in Nigeria, it's in Mozambique. We should be thinking big like that because we have the human c capital here that no other country in this region has, right? And there's oil everywhere. It's not just here, it's in TZ, South Sudan, Mozambique, whatever, and we have what they don't have, which is the human capital, the tech, and if we position ourselves as the regional experts, you're not only thinking about Tulo here, you're thinking about them in Uganda, them in Mozambique, everywhere they have operations, right? So opening your mind up, engaging with them, understanding would be the first thing, but I think opportunities are not just actually logistics, everyone is struggling with logistics. Uh, bring James Moria from Centum here. He sits with a portfolio of companies. Ask him business processes. Everyone is struggling with business process. Why is Java able to roll out like this now? Naivashan and Yuki, because it's, uh, it's tech. It's not money, it's not the food, it's not whatever. It's that they figured out a model of how to roll out and maintain consistency and what's animating that is really technology. Business process, logistics. Those are the games to play in, and it's not just oil and mining, it's any of these big sectors that are booming right now. But also have the oil and mining guys come and tell you what their issues are. Uh, and think about it from a regional play. If you build that expertise here, you'll be busy across the region. Okay, um, my name is Aisha. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you've mentioned a lot of, um, that there's a lot of women who are out there building up their businesses and th there seems to be a lot of activity by women uh, going up at the top. But however, it doesn't feel like it's trickling down. And um, so there's like a gap between the women who are making it the women who are pioneering and you know getting into leadership and everything but then when you come back down here the problems that uh, women are still facing are very basic problems that women have been facing forever so what do you think is the disconnect whereas what's happening up here is not uh, really uh, helping uh, what's happening down here So I, th I think one, um, and this is an issue is that, w you know, when women get to the top, do they not want to help other women and that whole, and so I don't think that's it, but I do think there's a pressure as a woman who's successful in a tough environment to sort of be on your toes consistently and it's tougher in a way sometimes that guys don't have to do that or you're juggling then so many, because you're trying to win on all three fronts, um, the e either the time or the energy or the ability or whatever is not there, just from a practical point of view. 
uh, and you also maybe don't want to be siloed now as a woman sort of thing because you're barely trying to stay in there with the guys. Um, I do think the gap or where the opportunity is, which is where I'm spending a lot of my time, I rarely speak now, rarely do conferences or keynotes or any of that. Uh, in fact, this was just a cut. They, 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 they need somewhere <laughs> to, to, um, uh, to get me to speak because it was students who reached out to me and, and it was a female uh, entrepreneur who reached out to me. I'm spending, Betty, right, was a guy that, uh, you know, I'm spending a lot of time speaking to young, yeah, Betty, right here, and she was, she was um, to younger women and to women in high school because that's where I feel I can make my connection. I'm not in a position to go down to the basic sort of survival issues that you, that you raise, but from my perspective, if I think of who, who am I in a position to influence or help out or hook up or connect, create networks, it's with younger female entrepreneurs, so that's where I'm investing my time. When I speak, I speak to them. When I mentor, that's where I'm mentoring. When I'm hooking up, that's where I'm hooking up people. Uh, and so what's needed is more of that, where you sort of say, okay, there's so many things I could be doing, uh, but I think maybe it's overwhelming and finding then what's your little thing or area or space that you can play in. Uh, but it, it would be foolhardy to say that, you know, now I've made it, I can sort of uh, address this, the problems of all women. I think there's a realization. So I know there are women who are working on board representation. Andia uh, Chakava is doing that. Wanjiru Kamal Rottenberg is investing in education for younger women. Um, there are those sort of forums that are coming up where sort of women speaking to other successful women or whatever. But some of it, I think, is time pressures or whatever. There is an element of, hey, I've just made, let me, let me just keep maintain my position. And at some point, I'll give back, or maybe not knowing how to do it and finding a tangible way. Uh, but I think for those who feel my example of what's working for me is, um, women in young girls in high school and women in u university and early female entrepreneurs who are grappling with a lot of the decisions I struggled with at that particular time. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like, I'd like all of us to stand up and, and to give a round of applause to Ori. <laughs> 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 And um, to pretty much celebrate Betty again uh, for, for organizing this, together with Tony and Roina. Where are they? Back there, yeah. <laughs> They're pretty much sorting it out. Uh, but once again, thank you all for coming. I'll hand it over to Betty to, to give the um, vote of thanks. And uh, that's it from me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kinyanjui. That was a good job as well. Um, so that was a great talk. Uh, if you ask me, Ori, this is the entire reason why Startup Grind exists. Uh, personally, I have learned so much um, that I could apply in my personal life, in my own entrepreneurial venture, in Startup Grind going forward, for example, about bringing industry to tech instead of just us techies living in our own world and inventing things. Um, so we have a gift for you, Ori. <laughs> a very humble gift, startup grind, going African. Because when you think Ori, you think Africa. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> that's Ori, speaker number two. So thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm so glad to have been lucky enough to have her open my email. I don't know, like the fact that I'm young, I'm an entrepreneur. And then just after we had gotten this in place, she got voted 10 uh, top 100 leaders. So it's like a series of events that just fell into place perfectly. Um, so thank you all for coming. This wouldn't be possible without you. I hope you got so much value. 
I'd like to thank our sponsors, Google for Entrepreneurs, um, the iHub for giving us the lovely space. I'd like to thank Biomocard, um, another startup, just guys like us who um, are passionate about creating value. And I'd like to thank my team, the Startup Grant team. This wouldn't be possible without them. Um, I'd also like to give a special shout out to my family. Um, please wave. <laughs> who showed up to give me support. Um, at the end of the day, it's that kind of foundation that gives you the strength to keep going. So I'm so grateful. Um, so guys, please hang around, have some more drinks, talk to people. I'm sure there'll be someone you'll meet here who you'll be grateful you met going forward. And I hope you'll be part of this startup grand journey with me going forward. Thank you.